court side of the virtual hardwood, it's the MLSC Podcast. This is episode 482. I am Andrew, Andrew in our forum, Andrew MLSC on Twitter. Joining me as always, my co-host Derek, DP3 in our forum, and DP3G and DP384 on Twitter. Derek, good to be talking to you as always. The Denver Nuggets are champions for the first time. Hats off to them on a great run. But what else is new? I predicted that outcome, Andrew. I said uh, the the Nuggets would beat the Heat in five games. Four to one, yeah. Uh, yep, four to one. And then predicted that the Celtics would lose against the Heat in six, uh, but they ended up losing in seven. But I'm feeling pretty good about my predictions. And uh, you actually agreed with those predictions as well, so you were right too. Yeah, I, I copied your exam paper and it uh, it paid off. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy for that Nuggets team. I'm happy for Jeff Green and... Aaron Gordon and I thought the footage of Aaron Gordon actually like going outside of the stadium and celebrating with the fans and everything and jumping up and down in the uh, the sea of fans in that crowd I thought that was really cool of him he seems like like a really approachable guy right like a real human you know and um it was you know it's nice to see Jokic who's a likable star you know win the title as well and um i've always been a fan of jamal murray's game but like i i like that nuggets team uh and you know i'm glad they ended up coming out on top me too i i also find them a very likable team uh, i know a couple of nuggets fans of course uh, uh kenny from the nlsc a uh, big long time nuggets fan so congratulations to him congratulations to uh to sean who i met at the uh community events the nba live community events a long time ago is actually from denver so uh yeah obviously a big nuggets fan and uh loyal through these years even with all the ups and downs and they made the run this year really cool to see really great fan base we'll see what happens with the uh miami heat you know with uh that roster because jimmy butler is not getting any younger i believe he's 33 right now uh his best years uh could be behind him uh, you know, as, you know, being a complete player and whatnot. I, I know that they're going to hang on to coach Spolstra because he's one of the best coaches, if not the best coach in the entire NBA. I mean, look how far he's brought that heat team over the last few years, further than anybody else would have ever predicted. So um, it will be interesting to see what happens with the heat. Funny to think that he was almost ousted during the uh, 2011 season. Yeah. Well, I mean, LeBron didn't take to him apparently, and tried to get him fired. He even went into Pat Riley's office and basically hinted at the fact that he wanted Spolstra out. And Pat Riley was like, nope, he's my coach. He's, he's going to be coaching this team and, you know, you're going to have to deal with it. So uh, he was, he did the right thing. You know, Spolstra helped them win two championships in 11, 12 and 12, 13. And he does the most with the least in my opinion, in the NBA, as far as, you know, an overall underwhelming roster, um, you know, developing talent and whatnot. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Spolster. No, he's had a fantastic career and obviously guided them to championships. Yes, it's helped that he's had uh, players like uh, a LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, etc. But certainly a fantastic coach. Also, shout out to Udonis Haslam. 20 years with the same team as an undrafted player. Unprecedented. Yeah, I mean... They did the right thing by keeping him on the roster this long because he was it, it was for the culture. Right. I mean, he wasn't yeah. playing big minutes. Um, but from what I hear, you know, he was an outstanding practice player. He was very motivating. Um, he said the right things. He was a good leader. And unfortunately, we don't have enough veteran leaders in the NBA nowadays. That's one of the biggest problems, in my opinion. And I believe that Steven Jackson said that on a podcast well, I think it was last year or the year before. And um, it's like they're pushing veterans out of the league and the league keeps getting younger and younger. And unfortunately, that makes it so a lot of these young guys in the league don't have the correct mentorship or leadership that they should have. And it makes them not develop as fast or not improve at all. I mean, you look at a situation, obviously on the court as well, but a situation like what John Morant is facing. If you have that veteran leadership to pull the young guys aside and say, hey, look, you know, you've got to handle your business professionally and uh, don't don't back up and, and so forth. You know, it, there's it's so much value in having that uh, the person who's been around the block a few times, has that maturity, is able to uh, command that respect in the locker room. Maybe they can't go as much on the court anymore or 
they can only give you a few minutes here and there in uh, in garbage time or whatever. But as you say, a great practice player, great mentorship, great advice. Uh, they still know the game really well, and they're people that uh, they're players other players can look up to and uh, and look to for guidance. Guarantee you that if Mark Gasol uh, was still on the Grizzlies, um, he's not in the league anymore. But if he was still, you know in the league and on the Grizzlies, he probably would have smacked John Moran upside the head a few times. Yeah. Uh, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't have put up with that behavior and that, um, you know, that detrimental behavior to the team. So yeah, no veteran leadership is huge. Uh, but Andrew back to basketball video games mm. because of that finals matchup, the Denver Nuggets versus the Miami heat. It had me and community member discord member whiz card rush thinking, Hey, Let's put those two teams on the floor in NBA 2K14 with the default rosters. So we connected on Parsec in combination with the Xbox app. We use the Nuggets. So we had, you know, Kenneth Fareed, Gallinari, JaVel McGee, Ty Lawson, Evan Fournier, young Evan Fournier, Nate Robinson on the bench. And of course, we were against the Heat, who had, you know, LeBron, Bosch, Wade, Ray Allen, Richard Lewis, Shane Battier. Birdman, who threw it down hard on us in the second half. It was a really realistic Birdman dunk, and then he pumped his fist after. They had Chalmers, Haslam, who we were just talking about, et cetera. And we talked about it on prior podcasts. The computer on NBA 2K14 is no joke. You've experienced it. I've experienced it. Um, when you play them, on the higher difficulty level so anything above rookie honestly they rarely miss they play incredibly smart they're hitting the cutters they're hitting the open shooters if you double team they'll make you pay immediately um when they attack the rim they rarely miss and because of that the difficult task of stopping the computer and how good and how solid they play defense we ended up losing that game by i want to say 25 to 30 points And we didn't feel bad. Uh, That was only the first game we had ever played together. So obviously there's growing pains in relation to that when you're playing co-op with another community member. Um, But at the same time, we just have to admit that we got beat by a much better team in that game. They're, They're much better in that game. And at the same time, just a really intelligent AI. I mean, that is defending champion... Uh, Miami Heat at the height of their powers, really. Uh, and yeah, you're definitely outmatched with that, uh, that that Nuggets team. And yes, as you said, being able to adjust to each other, playing uh, cult for the first time on a game. But incredible highlights because 2K14 is a spectacular game. Uh, you both know the game, obviously. So you're able to still make some great plays, even though, even though the Heat were a tough opponent. Yeah, and, and we were in it, you know, at the half. Like, we weren't down by too much. We still felt good about our chances. But they really, you know, put the pedal to the floor in the second half and just went on this huge run. But that video is up on the NLSE YouTube, the NBA 2K14 Heat versus Nuggets highlights. And I thought we did some pretty good things with Ty Lawson. Um, Evan Fournier was basically useless for us. So we ended up playing Nate Robinson big minutes in the first half. And he had a couple threes for us. JaVel McGee had a couple big dunks and you were able to drop step and score with him and whatnot. Uh, you commented on the couple of fantastic dunks by Kenneth Fareed, one in traffic on two people. And that was, and one. So, and a foul. And there was another one where he grabbed an offensive rebound, which Kenneth Freed was so awesome at anyways, because he was always getting the 50, 50 balls. And he went up and threw it down hard with a reverse jam. And I think we also had a few nice drives and threes with Gallo, Danilo Gallinari, but honestly, LeBron was too much. And obviously he's the cover athlete in that game. So they're not going to be shy on how good, they make him but i mean he was stepping out and hitting threes he dunked on us multiple times he was throwing dimes to you know bosh and wade and hitting battier open for threes so like it was brutal trying to stop lebron in the heat in nba 2k14 needed the uh needed the san antonio spurs to uh to do that uh that year and in that game i would be interesting to replay that matchup but you know we're, we're talking about where we see basketball gaming being in uh, five years on this week's show uh that's coming up a bit later in the show obviously but isn't it amazing how a game that is almost 10 years old turning 10 this year 2k14 is still such 
a wonderful experience, still even a preferable experience to uh, to a more recent game. It's still the best visually, so the best graphics wise and atmosphere wise in basketball gaming history in my opinion it's that jersey movement it's that eco motion system it's the reflections on the court it's the overall lighting it's the way the fans react to the action it's the crowd movement in general it's the rim physics you know when the ball hits the rim it's, it's 10 times better than nba 2k23 the game has life and you can get so immersed in the action. And I think that that's sorely missing in the newest titles. And that's why I always say, you know, just because time goes on, it doesn't mean that things automatically get better. Bad practices, um, bad decisions, uh, bad priorities over time uh, will negatively affect anything. And I think that that's what's happened when it comes to the visuals in the newest games and obviously the gameplay as well, which you and I would both agree um, openly to anybody that we believe the NBA 2K14 gameplay overall just feels quite a bit better. Absolutely. And it goes back to something we've talked about many times on the show, which is balancing the game for offline and online play and catering to the online scene and trying to be something it's not and bringing in these boosts, these artificial elements that we've talked about so many times because they do frustrate us so much in the newer games. Back in the days of 2K14, it was just about making the best basketball sim possible. Now, it did have an online scene, obviously, but that online scene was dictated by, okay, this game is a sim basketball game. It's going to have, I mean, yes, it's going to have signature skills as it does in 2K14. You do have some of those elements there you don't have this in-depth build system that on the surface looks like a great idea oh great customization for the game etc but there's so many variables so many boosts so many artificial elements so many ways that it can go wrong and then of course to fix it you need to grind hard or spend money but you didn't have that in 2k14 you didn't have these uh the, the all these builds that could go awry this this meta game that's now the focus it was just about having this realistic basketball game the best virtual representation of basketball they could make so you weren't trying to balance that online and offline scene or catering to the online scene or trying to be Fortnite with basketball or whatever it was just about being an nba sim and it shows it shows the difference between design philosophies that game is all about the nba and love for basketball that's what I look at it. Um, well said. And I applaud the developers, uh, you know, for what they did with that game and the suits who made decisions in relation to the um, structure overall of that game. But just the, the player movement, when you go from NBA 2K23 to NBA 2K14, it is incredibly eye-opening as far as something as simple as changing directions is so much smoother and feels so much better and more realistic in NBA 2K14 or catching the ball and going into like a quick first step or changing directions on the move, um, et cetera. Or, you know, or even just trying to do like a step back in the mid range, right. To, to create some space and get a look that you can actually knock down in NBA 2K14. Imagine that. But um, you just notice a lot of gameplay flaws when you visit those titles back to back, you see the gameplay flaws being in NBA 2K23. And of course, NBA 2K14 isn't a perfect game. But as far as the balance on offensive defense, as far as both of those areas of the game being strong, um, as far as defense being fun and more realistic with less canned animations, um, you know, same with offense, like NBA 2K14 wins out easily for me as a basketball gamer. And that's why when, when those gameplay videos go up, you don't see any negative comments, right? You don't see anybody in there saying, man, this game looks dated, right? Or somebody saying, man, these animations look janky or this, that, th this game, <laughs> you guys overrate this game. This game is not as good as you guys say graphically or gameplay wise. Like you don't see those comments because it's really hard to den deny what you're looking at. Yeah. People know. People see the greatness of that game. They still talk about it years later. Every time you post clips or I post clips, people talk about how great the game looks, how wonderful the lighting is. And we've talked about how 2K15 
kind of took a step back in that regard. Many other improvements they made over 2K14 uh, as far as a few gameplay tweaks, obviously, and certainly the uh, the modes <laughs> they improved in 2K15 and some of the, the features that were left out of that, uh, that jump to do what was then next gen. But it holds up so well. There's a reason that I'm still playing it. I'm really glad to see you and your brothers enjoying that season with the uh, custom Celtics, with the uh, fantasy uh, draft. Uh, was it a fantasy draft you did in that game? That's just legends versus regular teams. And we're actually, I, I want to say, 12 or 13 games into the season now playing 48 minutes a game. Right. And we are having an absolute blast. Incredible highlights. I mean, that uh, that Clyde Drexler alley-oop where he, he, kind of, he kind of steals Carl Malone's trademark on that one, actually. Yeah, he puts the hand behind the head um, and special does delivery. the special, yeah. Yeah, special delivery dunk. Um, yeah, how good do those clips look? Right? Like the highlights just blow you away. And we have so many great highlights that happen every single game that um, we have this like folder now that's chock full of NBA 2K14 potential top tens because it's just there's so many cool things that can happen in that game. And when you're using the stars like we are in that season uh just the op- the opportunities for great highlights are endless i mean kobe and jordan on the same team julius irving clyde drexler um you know you have larry bird wilt chamberlain bill russell Shaq, hakeem like put those guys against regular teams and look at the highlights that you can produce it's unbelievable and of course uh, a couple of highlights in the top 10 this week the, the f mentioned uh, clyde drexler dunk and that uh that behind the back to terry hansen that i had which uh very well, that was very satisfying to pull off almost an impossible pass right the difficulty on that is off the charts i mean you drove left so the left side of the rim jumped in the air and threw a behind the back pass to the opposite corner perfect placement terry hansen catches it and he knocks down a three and the reason why i got elevated to number two andrew is because terry hansen was involved it wasn't just you it was you and terry of hansen. course yeah the great terry hansen peanut butter and jelly bologna and cheese you two so that's why it got that high in the countdown yeah this top 10 by the way unreal i mean that number one play from on nba 2k22 from dibes 2k where it's jordan with bouncing it off of the blacktop and then going through one leg and then going through the other leg and throwing it down i have never seen that animation before that's the main reason it got the number one spot and just the sheer difficulty of something like that being done in real life but you know bucky t was in there again and then you know with another nba live 14 highlight with jimmy butler throwing it down in traffic after after a sweet spin move and then rel house i didn't even know that him and og billy cook knew each other but apparently they play nba live 19 together they had a great play where rel house gets the steal and then throws an alley-oop on the other end to oj billy cook who does a reverse dunk and then Chuck LA 92, who always brings it with Lakers highlights with a sweet acrobatic layup with Kobe Bryant on NBA 2K16. And then Live King with an awesome block, followed by a very realistic um, switching hands layup with Kyrie Irving. And that's on NBA 2K23. I love the variety of games that are being played and the uniqueness of all these highlights. That play from NBA 2K9 that was submitted by Cavs4872. I have never seen that animation before. It's LeBron getting double teamed, and he pushes the ball between the two defenders. Completely, what a unique animation. He pushes the ball between the two defenders, and then he throws it down on multiple players in traffic. Just like the community is really bringing it with the variety and the uniqueness of the highlights. No, I feel like we're saying it every week because it just does feel like the bar is getting raised, as I've said before. Uh, Great highlights this week, amazing highlights, uh, as you say, very unique. And how cool is it that when you've spent hours upon hours with a game, you're still finding new animations, a new dunk animation, a new elusive dribble animation. In that situation with LeBron James where he's splitting the defenders and making that move and putting on the floor and then going up with a dunk, and it all just comes together so superbly. It's just so much fun. This is why we play basketball games. I mean, they're going to have their limitations always. There's only so many animations you can include, only only so many lines of commentary dialogue. But when you hear a new line that you haven't heard often or haven't heard at all in all the years you've been playing a game, or you see that new animation and you string it all together and it pulls off something amazing and it, and it feels organic and satisfying, yeah, that, that's just awesome. And NBA 2K9 came out 15 years ago. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and Live 06, which has some of the best steel animations I've ever seen in a video game, if not the best, came out 18 years ago. Right. And I'm talking about the PC version. And it also has that whole splitting the double team type animation. Remember, I did that with Derek Rose when I was using the bulls and I showed that on Twitter where I split the double team and then I threw it down in traffic and whatnot. It is wild what some of these games from decades ago can produce and i know that you really enjoyed my nba 2k9 video that i uploaded to the nlsc youtube between the magic and cavaliers i was using the magic i went against the computer cavaliers and the main reason you enjoyed it was because of my petra stunks is that correct i think that's accurate to say i mean i mean i remember petra's very well from doing the roster updates for nba live at the time always uh it seemed like I was always having to adjust his ratings because he was getting better and better as a role player. But yeah, just some, uh, you know, I think you've uh, told me before that you called him uh, French Jordan, you and your brothers, when you uh, play with him. And uh, yeah, he, he certainly looked uh, quite MJ-like, uh, just exploding to the rim for those big dunks in that uh, that highlight reel. Great highlights all around, of course. But yeah, Petrus, uh, that name that sticks in my mind because of watching the NBA at the time, obviously, and doing all those roster updates and, and watching him become this solid role player. Kind of, kind of like an Alonzo G for you. We called him the French Jordan for years because in both NBA Live and NBA 2K games, he was way better at dunking than he really was in real life. Now, obviously, in real life, he could throw it down, but he wasn't throwing it down multiple times a game in traffic, right? He wasn't crossing somebody over and throwing it down on two or three people. That wasn't really his game. And later in his career, um, specifically when he joined my Celtics and whatnot, he was mainly just a spot up three point shooter. But yeah, he was the French Jordan in our house. But that game was fun because, again, that was the 2009 Eastern Conference Finals matchup between the Magic and the Cavs. And for the Magic in that game, I had, you know, Petrus, Jameer Nelson, Dwight Howard, who's just an absolute monster in NBA 2K9. Um, Hito Turkoglu, Richard Lewis, Courtney Lee, Tony Batie, J.J. Redick, and... Marcin Gortat and Gortat's actually a fake in that game. So I didn't even want him on the floor. He's, he's just like a generated player. He has hair. Like it's, it, it doesn't look anything like him. So I made sure to not, you know, keep him on the floor for long. Uh, and then obviously the Cavs had, you know, LeBron, Mo Williams, Zadrunas Ogoskis, Ben Wallace, you know, former all-star Wally Zerbiak, Delonte West. Like that team is actually pretty underrated and they're actually fun to use in video games because they have shooters they have people protecting the rim you can post up big z you i know you're not a fan of ben wallace but you can throw him alley-oops and whatnot um and obviously then you have the all-around playing and rim slashing lebron but i ended up pulling out that win uh petrus and dwight howard were incredible for me but jameer nelson hit the big shots in the game, including a few big threes. And that gameplay video is up on the NLSC YouTube if anybody wants to check it out. But NBA 2K9, great graphics for the time. Still fun to look at today. Great atmosphere, the way the fans react to the action, the exciting commentary, uh, et cetera. And you can just pull off a lot of moves with the trigger, like holding down the trigger, that type of dribbling. But then also having the crossover button which on my controller was b and then the spin move button which uh is y and you can just do a lot with that just like you can with nba 2k10 it's a game that i want to spend more time with i feel i've said a lot about the earlier 2ks but when i do go back and revisit them now and that i am more open to having that different control scheme it's not my preferred control scheme for dribbling obviously (laughs) there is a reason they went to right stick dribbling at long last and why they've kept it to this day but I'm finding those games far more playable these days, having over, uh, warmed up to the 2K series and being more open to uh, getting used to those controls. And I, I played it briefly when I was getting a couple of screenshots for the uh, the front page bulletin when I was sharing the video on the uh, on the main site, mb-live.com, of course. Um, yeah, and I'm thinking, I need to play this a bit more because that was fun. And obviously I'm playing with those teams that, uh, that you had on the floor, so I, I can definitely relate to that Magic team 
being uh, being fun to use. And uh, what a, what a memorable team! I mean, they only made the finals once, and uh, training for Vince Carter unfortunately didn't work out the next year. But but certainly that was a great run for the Magic, and uh, actually got a win from those those Lakers. Uh, didn't win the series, obviously. The, the Lakers uh, triumphed, but got the first finals win in uh, franchise history. Not even Shaq and Penny could could do that against the uh, underdog Rockets back in the day. But definitely a, definitely a fun game. Looks great, holds up, and of course the other thing that people pointed out in that uh, in those clips is that you had the those real video intros and just just we've talked about that before as well but whether it's the the main game intro when you boot up the game or whether it's those real highlights and so forth during the game introductions when you go into a game whether it's play now or a association game or whatever just how it hypes you up to play seeing those real highlights and how it adds to that presentation i'll touch on that in a second but uh i i wanted to talk about the orlando magic that you're kind of following the blueprint of the Akeem Olajuwon Rockets that won the title in 93, 94, and then again in 94, 95 with Clyde Drexler, they surrounded Dwight Howard with shooters. And Dwight Howard was so dominant um, that they had double him. Uh, there's There's been talk about Dwight Howard's lack of offensive game or lot, lack of offensive moves, lack of offensive ability. But go back and watch those games. Dwight Howard would just overpower the defense and he was really hard to guard and he had that little half hook that he could get going, et cetera. And they surrounded with him, surrounded him with shooters and it worked very similar to the way it worked for the 93, 94 Rockets when they surrounded Akeem with, you know, Kenny Smith and Vernon Maxwell and Robert Ori and guys like Pete Chilcutt, et cetera. Like that blueprint works um so yeah i wanted to point that out first uh but as far as the intros that's why i had to include it as part of that video because how cool is it to to you know hear the commentary and this it's kobe bryant's los angeles lakers and then they show real highlights of kobe you know throwing it down or hitting a mid-range shot or hitting a fadeaway etc and then it says versus you know kevin garnett's boston celtics and then you see highlights of KG, et cetera. It is such a cool touch. There's a lot of excitement and a lot of hype in those uh, pregame uh, introductions. Even in 2K14, where they, they do, they've done away with that, but there's still that uh, excitable voice. I think it's the same uh, person d- uh, doing the voiceover as of 2K14 that we, we just don't have in the newer games. Yeah, I've always said that NBA 2 k 14 halftime show. I actually prefer it over 2K23s with Ernie and Shaq um, and Kenny Smith. Uh, and the reason is is because Damon Bruce, who is the voice for the 2K14 halftime That's right, track, Damon Bruce. It's Damon Bruce, yeah. He does, he adds a level of excitement because of his tone and the way he talks about the action. And I absolutely love his voice on you know NBA 2K14 PC and NBA 2K14 for Xbox One PS4. And I always watch those halftime shows because of it. Yeah, there's a reason that I was including them when I was doing the uh, 2K14 Retro Series, and that will come back at some point. I will be playing some more games there. But it, it's just such great presentation. And it is ironic that the authenticity of having the NBA on TNT crew, albeit without the actual branding, that it's not as exciting to to have the authentic presentation in that regard. Yeah, I think it's just the way they talk about the action, and just some of it feels a little bit too. How do I say phony? I'm not sure how to how to word that exactly. It just doesn't it doesn't feel as organic as I would probably like it to. Makes sense. But yeah, yeah. I also, but I also like the way that NBA 2K14 presented the highlights as well. Um, the way the highlights look, the camera views chosen, um, and once again, the way the action was talked about. So, um, yeah, for me, I, I would prefer NBA 2K14 over 2K23 presentation-wise. Before we go on, a reminder that the NLSC podcast comes out every week on the NLSC, mb-live.com, as well as our YouTube channel. We're also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast apps. If you're listening on any of those apps, we'd greatly appreciate a review. To keep up with the show and everything we're doing with basketball gaming in general, connect with us on social media. On Twitter and Facebook, we are The NLSC. We also have an Instagram, NLSC Basketball. And on YouTube, we're youtube.com slash NBA Live Series Center. Once again, visit us at nba-live.com, where in addition to the podcast, you'll also find all of our original content, as well as our forum and modding community.
Speaking of the games from the 2009 season, I actually revisited uh, 09 yesterday, NBA Live 09, and uh, that held up uh, better than I thought. Uh, that's something I want to come back to on a uh, future show, maybe to do a deep dive after we've had an opportunity to connect over Parsec and play that on the emulator co-op and revisit it a few times ourselves uh, individually as well, most likely. But, you know, we talk about NBA Live 10 being a great game, and it absolutely was, but 09 is definitely on the way to 10. Some, uh, some good stuff in that game as well. And uh, speaking of presentation, uh, had it pulled off a uh, driving dunk with Derek Rose, and it was uh, flagged as a uh, top 10 Sports Center nominee came up with the branding. And that was a nice little touch as well. They did such a good job with the presentation in both NBA Live 09 and NBA Live 10. I, From a gameplay perspective, I always preferred NBA Live 10 because I think they smoothed out a lot of the gameplay. Agreed. Uh, they smoothed issues that were in nba live 09 where the players felt a little bit heavier in live 09 the moves had a little bit too much momentum so you didn't lose so you didn't have as much control there seemed to be more input lag when you tried to like more heavy animations um in live 09 and i just think they loosened up the gameplay so much in live 10 and as a result that's one of their best releases in franchise history i did want to say that Yes, we will connect on NBA Live 09 on Parsec using the Xbox 360 emulator. But I wanted to mention how much fun Wizcard Rush had during that NBA 2K14 Xbox One session over Parsec. He could not believe how great the game looked and felt connecting to me as the host. Um, And, you know, the new Xbox app is amazing. The visual quality is stunning. And... He just was able to sit back, enjoy the game. He said it looked like he was like sitting on the couch being the host of the game. That's how good the video quality was. Um, but yeah, it, it works. Parsec in combination with the Xbox app to play Xbox One games, it just works so well. So many testimonials from the community at this point, rightfully so. It's, it's been such a staple of our gaming rotation for at least a couple of years now, and it's, uh, it's not going to go away anytime soon. But, but as we look to the this week's main topic, you know, you look at games like Live 09 and 2K9, and it goes, it goes back to what we said about 2K14, that they were focusing on the NBA and making this great NBA sim. That was the whole point. That was they were, they were making it for basketball aficionados, basketball enthusiasts. And as I've said before, I don't want to gatekeep here. Basketball and basketball gaming should be for everyone. But when you do try to expand beyond basketball and and compete with other genres and make the game something they're not, you do lose that authenticity. You do lose that focus on basketball that that made 2K the premier brand in basketball gaming, sim basketball gaming. That's why it overtook Live, that it was doing all these great things and focusing on being this great basketball experience and this authentic basketball experience and doing it better than Live. As we said before, Live was trying to be realistic. People say it's, it was trying to be arcade. No, it wasn't. It was trying to be realistic, but it wasn't doing it as well as 2K. And that's why 2K pulled ahead. Right, 100%. And that's the thing is you go back and play a game like NBA Live 14. I mean, hell, you can't even really accelerate in that game. Trust me, people, they weren't trying to make a super arcade. <laughs> we tried. We tried. <laughs> Game. right um yeah we did we definitely tried um they were trying to focus on sim um you can tell you know the way the quick plays work how how fast the players go into motion um you know the espn presentation the way they talk about the action the way they worked on the signature shots in the game to make boozer and jimmy butler and corver shots etc look so authentic they were going for sim and they've been going for sim for a very very long time unfortunately like you had stated They just didn't do it as well as 2K, and they didn't market their games as well either. Um, So, yeah, I mean, my community question in our today's main topic, you know, I was asking, where do you see basketball gaming five years from now from a graphics, gameplay, customization, cost standpoint? So from those four in those four areas, but and at the same time, you know, how many players do you think will be in the basketball gaming space? Is it just going to be 2K is live coming back is maybe live coming back and then somebody else like San Diego Studios coming into the fray. So before I get into my thoughts on that and the community's responses, I wanted to ask you, where do you see basketball gaming, Andrew, five years from now? 
You know, I had to think about it because I've been looking back so much, obviously, and, and playing these older games and looking back rather than looking forward. But it, it is important to look forward, obviously. And, you know, graphically speaking, I think that the games are already at a point where, uh, for the most part, they are looking spectacular. I mean, you, there are some screenshots from 2K23 that maybe but for the lighting and a couple of uh, off faces, look extremely realistic. Uh, I think graphics are going to continue to be impressive. Even if they stay around the level that they're at now, I don't think we're going to lose too much with uh, with the graphics. And of course, gameplay is paramount. Gameplay, it's difficult not to feel cynical about that because it, it, there are so many other factors that focus on boosts, once again, that focus on... Uh, on the online scene that's not necessarily uh, conducive to a, a more realistic experience. Uh, I do think they certainly do their best with it, but they're always going to be battling that balance between offline and online, the traditional experience, the sim-based experience, and the supposed stick skill experience of the online scene. But again, as we've said before, stick skills often take a backseat to the, uh, to the meta gaming. Customization, I think, is going to remain about the same. Uh, what I do think we'll see is some more uh, my NBA eras. I think they're going to try to get uh, more uh, players under uh, under likeness uh, rights, so some to likeness deals, and we're going to see some other starting points for my NBA eras. At least I certainly hope so. I think that would be awesome. Uh, the cost, I think, the cost of basketball gaming is just going to go up. Uh, I think the the base price is going to remain the same. They did that ten dollar increase, obviously, with the uh, with the current generation, the the current new generation, if you will. But as far as being able to upgrade a player and or, or packs in my team, etc., I think is going to be. I think it's just going to increase. They're going to find ways to keep pushing people towards the recurrent revenue mechanics. Unfortunately, because there are people that justify it, it's optional, and of course they're very effective with the pressure. FOMO is a very strong uh, factor in uh, getting people to spend these days. Unfortunately, the number of choices in the space, unfortunately, I think is where I'm the most uh, cynical and pessimistic, which I hate to say. And as the more years go by and we don't hear anything from live, I'm, I honestly lose hope that it's, that it's ever going to come back. Uh, I hate to say that, but I am losing optimism in that regard. But we, we could see somebody else jump into the space, certainly, like San Diego Studios or another developer. I'd certainly like to see it. I hope we do see it. I hope EA does come back with something, whether it's a college basketball game or even if they resurrect NBA Jam once again. But... I think we're we're never going to see the same amount of choices that we had back in the 90s, certainly, and even through to the mid-2000s. That's just my take. It is more pessimistic and cynical than it used to be, but uh, 2K's just got such a stranglehold on the on the market these days. I definitely agree with that we need competition in the space. And Andrew, I am actually a little bit more positive, and this is almost going to sound like a wish list that you're going to hear as far as my response. Um, five years from now, we'll, it'll be 2028. And we will be embarking on a new console, which means a new era for basketball gaming. Because if you think about it, the PS4, Xbox One console generation began with NBA 2K14 and ended after 2K20. That's roughly six or seven years. So in 2K21, that was the first next-gen game for PS5 and Series X. And in 2028, once again, we're at that six, seven year mark. So we will be looking at a, a brand new generation. So this is what I think will happen. But I think it's also more, more of me being incredibly optimistic. I think graphics wise, improvement in relation to more realistic lighting and atmosphere, as well as muscle tone on the players. Like, I don't think the players are going to have as much of a Gumby look. They're going to have to improve that eventually, Andrew. Jerseys will not have the movement of 2K14, but I believe that the textures will improve as opposed to where right now there's like no textures, it feels like, on some of the jerseys, and it looks like the jerseys are completely stuck to the players. Now, remember, that's me thinking that we are moving on to like a PS6 at that point and that we will have the opportunity to even have more improved hardware that's going to allow us you know and nba 2k to do more gameplay wise i think that the animations will be smoother and more fluid and part of that i think is because we will have competition at the space which in the space which i will get to in a minute and 
I will. And also the other reason is, is because we'll have moved on to a different motion system. The lifespan of the 2K17 motion system lasted roughly six years. So it was like since 2K11, 2K11 to 2K17, a lot of the same bones were still there motion system wise. And then if you think about it, you know, we'll have been with this motion system since roughly 2k18 so you think we're going to be at the exact same motion system from 2k18 to 2k28 i doubt it so i think there will be a change even if it's just for the new generation of consoles i think rim mechanics will get back to being more realistic uh, and the body to body detection system will finally be improved the rim mechanics we've talked about this before they have really taken a step back right now it's like swish or bust uh, you never get the bounces on the rim like you do in games like NBA 2K14 and, and you know before that. The rim mechanics are absolutely unrealistic and terrible, and the variety on makes and misses um, is a lot worse in NBA 2K23 than it was in the past. And I feel like that's going to have to improve eventually and at least be on par with some of those great past games. I think that the body-to-body -body detection system will have finally improved, hopefully, by PS6. So, so we will not see as many cases of limbs going through each other's bodies. I mean, there will be the occasional situation where that happens, but I don't think it will be as often as it does now. However, I do believe that artificial boosts and the metagaming will not be going anywhere. In fact, I think they'll be expanded on. Customization, I believe we will get court, jersey, and overall team creator options offline, meaning outside of my NBA, and there will be an ability to share those creations with the community, including entire rosters that have that work included. I think, personally, that is the next big thing in customization, and I think that will be wildly popular with the consumer base however i do not believe that the create a player feature itself will show much improvement mainly because of you know possible issues with licensing and they want to make sure that we're a little bit limited on what we can create as far as player likenesses i think a scoreboard creator could possibly be in the future as well within the next five years as well as an option to choose your presentation settings um you know game in and game out uh, cost, I believe the base game will still be roughly the same with the old, with a possibility of maybe like a $10 increase, but I believe microtransactions will still dominate the game, which is what you alluded to as well, leaving gamers feeling frustrated. I think that microtransactions, they are not going to pull that back. Even if a, co a competitor gets into the space, I don't think they're going to be pulling that back. It's full steam ahead, and I think it's only going to get worse, unfortunately. Competition, I believe that we will not only have one competitor in the space, but possibly two. And my reasoning is because this can't last forever. Like I, I believe EA's NBA Live will be back, and hopefully somebody like San Diego Studios steps in as well. I also think that within the next five years, we will get a, either a new NBA Jam or a new street game that is marketed that is from a triple a company etc and one that will hopefully be received well so here's why i'm hesitant to believe andrew what i just predicted because that all sounds great right oh sounds fantastic i mean that level of customization we've wanted that for years i mean we've got some great customization tools for example in uh, in my nba and my league in uh, in last gen but having that and not having to do as much manipulation and modding outside of the game there was a time when I said I thought the future of modding was going to be in-game with all these tools, but we, it hasn't happened yet. And obviously all those improvements to gameplay and so forth, and getting somebody, another competitor back in the space, it does sound too good to be true. I agree, but I'm trying to be positive here. That's fair. <laughs> One of us needs to be. <laughs> right. So here's why I'm hesitant to believe what I just said. So from a gameplay standpoint, and even from a visual standpoint, I believe we have taken a step back in many ways in recent years. And recently, they have taken away many customization features related to editing players uh, while increasing the artificial boosts, the metagaming aspect, and the need to spend more in the form of microtransactions. So all of that stuff um, has really hurt the series over the last few years. They continue to neglect the classic teams and players they put into the game, using that content for marketing while at the same time halfwaying the content. You know, rushed signatures, uh, tendencies, attributes, copy-paste jobs, 
et cetera. You know, the poor foot planning, the constant suction issues in relation to gameplay, overbearing number of canned moments, ball warping consistently on dribbles and the janky awkward movement of the players are all issues in the current title in 2k23 um and many of those issues were not present or they weren't as bad in the enjoyable past titles so my prediction would be like you know for a lot of this in relation to gameplay is 2k finally smartening up right and maybe being kept honest by competition in the space and maybe being motivated by new hardware, by like a PS six, right. By hitting a new gen, et cetera. But it's hard to be optimistic because of all of the issues that are in NBA 2k 23 and all of the new issues um, that have been introduced since the new motion system in NBA 2k 18. So I am optimistic I'm going to try to put my best foot forward with each release by the game, give it a fair shot. But um, yeah, we'll see what happens. No, we, we absolutely need to do that. Need to, to give each game a chance uh, and, uh, and evaluate it fairly, obviously. And we can't stress it enough that it does come down to competition in the space, ultimately, because if people don't have a choice, then they do want a, a basketball game, a new basketball game every year and we'll get 2k and try to make the most of it and, and look I, I tried to make the most of some really rough nba live releases so i'm not going to criticize anybody for trying to squeeze the most fun they can out of 2k which is by and large a much better game than those uh, <laughs> in fact far 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 better game than those rough nba live releases uh, even with their issues but i i mean i, I certainly do hope for the best but it, it is uh, difficult not to be cynical after so many previous seasons and uh and broken promises you know to be to be blunt about it you know before we get into the community responses uh on this topic uh Escuela de gamer said how fake was that nba 2k21 ad and uh yeah i, I mean look at look at the hype that that generated which it certainly did but was was kind of misleading to to put it nicely so yeah because nba 2k23 for next gen so ps5 and series x the cyber faces of the players the player models the jerseys all of that stuff that looks basically identical um from a graphic standpoint texture standpoint etc as ps4 xbox one it really does like it's like interchangeable the the faces the bodies all of that stuff and the trailer the um the teaser we'll say for nba 2k21 next gen with zion and everything it made it look like they were really bringing it building it from the ground up right like that the player models were going to be different they were going to be more lifelike um it, the you know it alluded to better player movement all of that stuff but it was basically a fib andrew it was it was marketing and they were successful right because people latch onto it and they were like oh my god this is going to be amazing um and then i think everybody kind of got the big picture once they you know finally installed the game and of course a big part of being able to be sufficiently hyped and stay hyped is is honesty and being able to believe those trailers and to believe those previews and believe those developer blogs and not look back at previous developer blogs and identify uh, misleading statements and times when they've outright lied and said oh this was an improvement and turned around a year later and said oh actually that, that was a band-aid fix you know we, we brought that up many times before because it, it does get swept under the rug way too often but to stay hyped and to be sufficiently uh, optimistic we do need that trust we do need that honesty in previews yeah and i also want to point out that i think ps5 and xbox series x are incredibly disappointing and do not feel overall like a jump from mm. ps or xbox one you know Agreed. i you know i played so many different games on ps4 gen and there are no ps5 or xbox series x games that i've seen that in that i don't think could have been on ps4 gen um including the nba 2k series nba 2k 21 nba 2k 22 and nba 2k 23 the graphics do not blow me away i'm not seeing a significant improvement in anything like related to frame rates during cutscenes or um you know additional gameplay improvements etc i i think that the launch has been incredibly disappointing on both of those new consoles and i also think that the limited number of new titles is really disappointing because people are spending a lot of money 
on these new consoles and there's such a small game library still all these years later such a limited new selection of games so um yeah i'm not a fan of ps5 or series x i mean i I like some of the things about the console but as far as the as you say the library of of games it it has and, and the innovations it definitely has been disappointing compared to the previous generation you wonder if we've kind of plateaued in that regard the fact that I'm mostly using my PS5 to play a PS4 game that's almost 10 years old is uh, is quite telling. You know, you look at uh, Bethesda uh, revealing that uh, that Starfield on Xbox Series X and S is only going to be 30 frames per second, which has obviously caused some controversy there. So these these innovations just aren't happening as they were last generation or indeed the generation before. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a shame. You know how I feel about 30 FPS, Andrew. I do. Well, oh, people so. try to say people try to say you know when they're reviewing a game or they're trying to talk up a game they're like oh you really can't tell the difference uh, no you can tell the difference there's a big difference between 30 and 60 fps 30 fps is mostly choppy i can do side by sides all day of 30 and 60 fps um 60 fps is just so much smoother and so much lifelike uh so much more lifelike as a as a result it's more pleasing to the eye yeah that's the thing is you know ps5 in xbox series x 2ks look at those cutscenes. what are those still in andrew they're still in 30 fps yeah a lot of the highlights are still in 30 fps and whatnot you know i thought when we got to the new generation of consoles that they were going to smooth those pieces out and you know yes we do have faster load times that was an, imp- an improvement um but yeah again i'll say again i am not thoroughly impressed at all with ps5 uh in series x I mean, if the experience on the sticks isn't as fun, then it doesn't really matter how fast you can get into it, really. Right. I also want to point out, I read something about Starfield, and I'm not sure of the accuracy of this, but apparently there's rumors that the reason why it's in 30 FPS is because they didn't want to delay the release of the game. So instead of trying to optimize it to make it 60 FPS, they decided, hey, we want to stick to our release date and we're just going to release it in 30 fps and i'm sorry but i call i call bs now what we're seeing that it, it's kind of a, a generation-wide issue so it's not just basketball gaming it's not just us being bitter basketball gamers Th- these issues are being recognized throughout the industry throughout the the medium if you will with this uh, generation so it, it is concerning but maybe as you say the the ps6 and whatever the uh, xbox is called whatever the next xbox is called uh xbox series y who knows um yeah we will see my thing is, is, and this is why I'm optimistic, is there has to be a jump at that point, right? Sure. Like, we can't go into a PS6 gen with, once again, Xbox One, PS4 graphics and optimization, right? Like, I just, I feel like they're at that point, there's going to have to be a big improvement. Technologically speaking, absolutely. The design principles they have and things like recurrent revenue mechanics, obviously, uh, they, they're not going to go away. And they're always going to be an issue, even with the even with more powerful tech. So it does obviously come down to that as well. And, and once again, competition. But yeah, that's our take on it. And we have some great responses from the community. So let's get to those now. Uh, first up, we have Phil Lime 2002 says that he expects uh, great graphics, uh, average to decent gameplay, uh, potentially too much like NBA Jam with demigods or simply overpowered gameplay, uh, more customization than we have now, uh, likely not cheaper. $100 for build is not a good indicator. And as for competition says, can't be more one-sided than now, I hope, for NBA Live. And uh, I would tend to agree with that across the board. Yeah, obviously we can't have less competition in the space than we have now. The only way we could have less basketball games is if 2K shut up shop, which we obviously don't want to see and I can't see happening anyway. And, and yeah, I don't. as I said, I don't see it getting cheaper because people just do keep pumping the money into making at least one build and sometimes even more. And uh, And yeah... The, the concerns about that metagaming and bringing in those elements that are a bit more arcade in a, uh, in a sim game, the, the takeover mechanics and so forth. Now, I think those are very reasonable uh, expectations and concerns, if you will. 100%. I like the way he broke that down. I also like the fact that he did mention, uh, you know, basically 2K going in this super arcade-leaning and unrealistic direction, you know, with things like TakeOver and then the 80 badges that are in the game, just all the artificial boosts and the metagaming and all of that, and, you know, trying to copy Fortnite and get that crowd into the basketball gaming scene and then turning the game into an RPG with all of these silly quests and all of that stuff in in my career. Um, It definitely has been moving 
further and further away from being about basketball and about simulation and all of that stuff. And he is right to fear that it will, you know, possibly continue in that direction. And unfortunately, you know, if no competitor comes into the space to give people a viable five on five sim option where they feel like they're playing more like real basketball or the real NBA, et cetera, then, um, yeah, unfortunately, consumers will be out of luck. And on a similar note, Real House says graphics, uh, simply graphics, I'm, I'm guessing basically to say that they're going to be pretty much the same as they are now. Uh, same BS gameplay, boring customization, overpriced cost and limited choices at this point. So uh, I definitely feel the uh, pessimism and cynicism there. I, I don't disagree with it. I, I can certainly uh, relate to it. And uh, yeah, I, it's, it's difficult to see too many choices coming back into the space. And, and you know, I've been thinking about this, Derek, that while we, while we do have a lot of nostalgia for having a lot of uh, different games on the market, and I wouldn't be against it, I, I can see how that wasn't good for the market or how that wasn't sustainable because you weren't getting, there was only a limited amount of sales to go around. Obviously, the brand leads were going to get, we're going to get most of the sales uh, live in 2K traditionally and then 2K taking over and uh, really taking over the sales from, from, uh, from live uh, in 2008 as they did. So I don't think we'll ever see that again because it's probably not uh, sustainable to, to have in the marketplace, but at least one or two other choices we absolutely need. Right. I think three would be the golden number, mm. to be honest with you. You know, back when we had NBA Live, the NBA 2K series, and then the NBA uh, 09, 08, et cetera, you know, the um, Sony series. Like, I think that that would be awesome for gamers because it would give them three choices in the five on five sim space and i think that all of those companies if they market their games correctly and make their games fun um and deep etc that all of them could win right there's enough basketball gamers out there where these companies they could all win um i agree with you when there was like six different games or seven different games out there for five on five sim um no way was that sustainable yeah. So I, I do think that a college basketball option will be coming soon, if not this year, next year and whatnot. And that's just going to be a nice thing, right? It's going to be a different gameplay experience. Um, it's going to be kind of a blast from the past when we used to get an NBA release and a college release. And I think that the college basketball is still huge, um, you know, worldwide. So I think that um, getting a college basketball game out there is going to be uh, a breath of fresh air for the um, basketball gaming base. Absolutely. And, you know, I've seen some comments on our YouTube videos recently uh, when we put up the uh, Live 14 and Live 15 videos that people are talking about having that that alternative, that even though that was a rough uh, generation for NBA Live, simply having a different game to play, to just give a try, give a go, uh, people appreciated that, even if it wasn't up to the standard of NBA 2K, which in many respects it wasn't, that it was still something different to play, an alternative. So even if it is inferior, which it's probably bound to be on a return, it's not going to take over 2K straight away, if ever, but simply having a quality alternative, or just something that feels different, that's just so important. A different game with different presentation, different gameplay, different graphics, different commentary crew, um, different structure to their modes, different players that you can unlock, um, a different type of depth, a different type of microtransaction or virtual currency system or whatever. Um, like yeah just having that competitor in the space is not only great for options for the gamer but it also can keep nba 2k honest right it can it can keep 2k sports honest and possibly make them change their ways um in relation to stuff that's kind of negative for the consumer base next up we have sweet jones underscore otf big perk of course uh, as far as improvements are concerned, says graphics more than anything, maybe movement, if they don't be chatty with the money and improvements, LOL. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's always, it's always going to be about the recurrent revenue, Derek. Yeah, unfortunately, like I said, I don't think that's going anywhere. I think that um, the base game is going to probably say, stay the same price. Um, and like I said, maybe an increase of like $10 or something like that over the next five years. But the microtransactions is where they make their most money. I shared that article um, on the podcast uh, a few episodes ago. And I also shared it on Twitter and in the Discord where it was stating that 2K makes far more off of microtransactions than they do the actual game sales. So do you really think that the suits are going to you know, scale that back when that's their moneymaker? No way. If anything, it's going to ramp up. So that's unfortunate. 
And before we head over to the Discord, one more response on Twitter now from Bucky T says, Graphics, I can't see a huge difference because look how good 2K14 was and it came out 10 years ago. Gameplay, hoping they go back to the basics and focus on actual gameplay. Uh, customization, feeling hopeful. Uh, cost, believe it'll go up to $150. And a number of choices in the space, once again, hopeful. And that's kind of how we have to be as far as customization and other features and extra years in my NBA eras and so forth a uh, number of choices obviously we can but cross our fingers and hope for the best I'm not sure if it'll go up to $150 Derek but I, I think that's as far as buying the game but as far as being the base cost to enjoy it if that's what he's talking about there I, I can certainly agree there in fact it's probably going to be even more really and, and graphics you know he, he brings up 2k14 and, and yeah as a spot on well we already have a $150 version of the game it's just one that gives you virtual currency and some, you know, my team perks, et cetera. Um, we have a $150, $170 version for NBA 2K23. So, and I don't think that's going to go anywhere anytime soon. And I think that the they make bank off of having these multiple versions because virtual cu- currency is what allows a lot of the gamers to have fun by having that virtual currency so they can upgrade their player so they can get packs so they can get the players that they want in my team so they can basically enjoy the game and i think that's the i think that's one of the biggest problems with the 2k series is people think that they have to um pay to win the pay to have fun that they have to shell out all of this money to you know make it so they don't have to grind and spend their entire life on the game. Because at the end of the day, these people just want to have fun with the game and they also want to have fun with their friends. So, um, you know, and a lot of these people, these gamers, they're teenagers, Andrew, they're kids, um, or they're young adults. And I just feel like the mechanics in the game are predatory and they take advantage of the teenagers, the young adults, etc. And, I don't blame the gamers as much as I do the suits because the gamers, they only have one option in the space, Andrew, one basketball five on five sim gaming option. And if they love basketball and they want to hit the virtual hardwood, where else are they going to go? Right. Um, So they take advantage of that fact. 2K takes advantage of that fact. And unfortunately, they make bank off of it and people lose out. I mean, they've weaponized FOMO, right? And they've weaponized the uh this culture of dressing up your my player and th- they do have people shilling for that business model and saying things like oh you want to be 99 overall in that first week and no nobody does or i guess maybe some people do but most people just want to have that fun journey to upgrade a player and they want to have a player that's viable to play with uh, online fairly soon and not having to do a, a bunch of grinding or pay a bunch of money to actually have a player that's viable for the online scene and they'd happily play through the offline my career campaign but it's not as fun as it used to be by design so that again i i I can see why people might uh, be frustrated with their fellow gamers for supporting it but at the same time as you say ultimately it's the suits it's the greed uh these mechanics are not necessary to make a fun game in in fact they often detract from the game and the fun that it can potentially provide but yeah it, it comes down to the suits Right. I, I have a lot of trouble blaming a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old child or yeah. teenager, et cetera, um, for, you know, falling for predatory mechanics. Right. For, you know, wanting to play a game and feeling like, hey, you know, if I'm going to be able to have this escape, if I'm going to be able to have fun, all of that stuff, um, you know, I better spend that money. I mean, that's the thing that's missed in this is, you know, we're not dealing with all adults and you know we're not dealing with you know a consumer base that always has a you know a boatload of money either um where there's there's kids that buy this game and young adults that buy this game so um yeah i don't know i i'm not a fan of it you know that i think that um it's incredibly predatory and we actually have a response that uh, that just came in here from uh, Roger Ward, one of the Live One legends, of course. Says uh, graphics can't get much better. Gameplay can always improve, although nineteen to twenty one seems stagnant. I don't see the need to charge more than seventy bucks, since most kids buying the game will spend tons on BC. We'd all love an alternative like NBA Live, but I highly doubt that's coming soon. And, and yeah, that goes back to what we said. And 
you don't need to charge more than 70 bucks because uh or around about the same price in Australian dollars as well, because people will pump that money into VC. And unfortunately, uh, kids will do that. And people who, who can't afford that, and adults who can't really afford that and try to justify that purchase of the game to try and enjoy it, just put a little bit more money into that. And even if you can't really afford that. And it comes down to the whole people saying, and I hate this, Derek, because this has become a thing. People saying, oh, you're too broke to afford that. You shouldn't have to. And some people do just budget to buy a game, a once-off purchase, which is how gaming used to be, just putting it out there. So I, I hate the whole you're just broke narrative because even people who can afford it uh, should really be saving their money and not giving it to 2K uh, on these predatory practices. But the fact that they do target people who are uh, who have problems with addictions and gambling addictions and so forth, and my team is all about that with the gambling mechanics in particular, my career is pretty straightforward as far as pay for, what you, pay for, pay for ratings upgrades. I don't like it. I'm not justifying it. Don't get me wrong. But you are at least getting something tangible in, in a way. You, you're, you're paying for an upgrade that is there. You're not paying for the chance to get a card, as with the gambling mechanics of my team. It's all predatory, don't get me wrong, but there is that aspect to it. But it is preying on people who have the problems with impulse control, people who don't have the money to spend, people who have gambling addictions and are trying to replace gambling addictions with something a bit more healthy, like just playing video games and so forth. So, yeah, it, it, it's just gross all around. And it doesn't matter if everybody was rich, Andrew. What exactly. happened to being uh, fair? Exactly. Yeah. What happened, to, right? So, like, even if everybody had the money to do this, that doesn't make the practice in itself right. Value for it money. It doesn't make yeah. it fair. Right. It doesn't mean it makes sense. Um, so it can still be predatory to somebody who's rich, somebody who's poor, to a child, to a 30-year-old, to a 40-year-old. It can still be unfair. So, um, yeah, no, I like Roger's take on that, especially the comment about 2K19 um, and the games that came after it. Uh, my brother and I, we've been playing NBA 2K19 a ton. We will die on the hill saying that the gameplay overall is quite a bit better than nba 2k 23 uh and the ai is quite a bit smarter as well it's a lot more fun to play the computer in nba 2k 19 and finally over on the discord pep says in regards to cost they'll put more and more pay to win stuff until somebody possibly the government regulate that and that, that is obviously comes down to uh, governments around the world belgium has already done that banning those practices and uh, 2k cannot uh, cannot have vc in Belgium as a result of that. They, they tried to appeal that. They tried to appeal to their uh, Belgian uh, gamers and say, oh, protest the government about this. And that didn't go well because people don't like microtransactions, as it turns out. So there was pushback there, and that was uh, heartening to see. And, and obviously, this has come up a lot, cost and microtransactions, and it is a, an issue we've touched on before. And But I think the fact that so many people are have that concern, Derek, about uh, microtransactions in response to this question, why it keeps coming up like this, it is one of the big factors that is standing in the way of enjoyment because it does infiltrate all aspects of design. It, it does affect the fairness of each mode, as you said. So, it, and, and the way the mode is designed, and oh, we're putting in the neighborhood and the city because this is a way to get people to spend money on uh, on VC to get clothes and quicker upgrades and keep people in this virtual world and hopefully spending money on virtual money to to buy things and go karts and and other things to participate in the uh, the weekly races in the uh, in the city to get the big prizes but sometimes you need to spend vc to make vc as it <laughs> so it seems so it it just infiltrates every aspect of those core modes so it's not just a case of oh it's optional and you know how I'll always push back on the it's optional rhetoric but this is why it keeps coming up because it is such a concern with the way the games are designed now yeah, I mean, yeah, can you imagine like uh the people like begging for microtransactions? They're like, "Listen, let's fight that. Let's I'm going to side with 2K on this appeal. We want microtransactions in the game." <laughs> those su um, those suits deserve a yacht, damn it. Yeah, I, exactly. Um no, uh yeah, I can agree with that. Uh, you know, when you go into my team, it's like a damn casino, Andrew. Yeah. All the flashing lights and the and the rotating cards and the um just the whole setup is supposed to encourage gambling, right? It's not an accident. That's just no. what it feels like, right? It's definitely not an accident. There's no way that it's an accident. And I don't believe that it feels optional for a lot of these kids. I'm going to say it again. Kids, Andrew, they make up a large portion of these sales. Yep. Kids, children, like teenagers, et cetera. Let's not, we, we can never forget that, that that's a huge target. 
And with NBA Live 19 was released, we talked about that too. They were more fair, right, to the gamer as far as their mechanics. But what was their target audience, Andrew? Teenagers. That's right. You could see it throughout their entire presentation in the one and everything. So just whenever we're talking about microtransactions, when we're, whenever we're railing against it, whenever we're saying that it's absolutely terrible and predatory, I want you to remember that that is one of the biggest reasons why we say it. Kids, children. But yeah, no, I definitely agree with everybody who's mentioning microtransactions as an issue. Um, and like I said, I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. So I guess we'll see where we are in uh, 2028. Uh, you know, I might, might actually be up to 2028 in my 2K14 my career by that point. I can't believe it. I, I mean, you are, you know, rolling through season six right now, and you might actually finish a full career on a video game. And what better video game to do it on than 2K14? Absolutely. Going back and enjoying that game after having that uh, sour first impression, which I've gone into before, I won't go into again. But yeah, I'd love to play through to the current day, at least. I'd love to get up to 2023 or, I guess, 2024 uh, over the next uh, uh, 12 to 18 months. I think that'd be pretty cool. Five years from now, we were talking, that's like the the main topic. But five years from now, Andrew will still be playing 2K14. That is my prediction. <laughs> there's a he good, will still be there's playing. There's a good chance. Absolutely. <laughs> But thank you to everybody who sent in those responses to Derek's question. We love having that interaction each and every week. And uh, yeah, even if we are feeling a little bit uh, uh, skeptical, cynical, uh, pessimistic at this point, I think there's still a reason for optimism as well. We do see some great stuff going on with 2K. The My NBA eras, obviously, was a big deal in 2K23. And I hope they build on that, Derek. I hope they do add some more starting points. Uh, you know, 1998, obviously, with the, the Last Dance and so forth. Uh, is, is comes to mind as a, as a great starting point as well. Just a few more starting points through the decades, I think would be a great addition to uh, my NBA eras. Right. I also want to point something out. There isn't one person that listens to this that should think that Andrew and I are hating on 2K. Look at the way we're talking about NBA 2K14, NBA 2K9, 2K19, 2K17, etc. We are playing 2K games consistently and often, right? And we have so much praise for so many of their past titles. That doesn't mean that the critiques that we have are not valid for the series now and the series moving forward. So do not consider us haters in this. In This This is us literally just you know, presenting valid critiques. We want to see the, ga- the games get better and we want to see them more fair to consumers. Exactly. And we want to be honest with you, our listeners, and with the readers of my articles and everything else. That is important as a content creator to uh, to be analytical, to know your stuff, obviously, but also, above all, to be honest with your audience and not try to take advantage of them for clout or to lie to them for uh, for views or clicks or whatever. Uh, I wrote the, that article on uh, clickbait, uh, no news being no excuse for clickbait this week, in, uh, last week in Monday Tip-Off, Derek. And yeah, I absolutely believe that. And it, I, I hate to see content creators uh, lie to their audience and uh, and yeah, just do whatever they can for clout, e- even if it's putting out subpar content. I mean, certainly misleading content. I mean, that's the worst of all, lying to your audience. Yeah, and unfortunately that happens a little bit too often, right? Yeah. Especially if there's people with perks, um, you know, whether it be monetization or um any other perks in general like i think that um clout has often become more important um clout fame monetization etc has become more important than truth and it's running rampant um on you know most social media platforms and on a lot of different video games. So, yeah. And again, we're, you know, we're at the height of the internet, height of social media, et cetera. That's something else that I don't think is going to get better anytime soon. It's not, but we're going to do our best to push back against it and be that, uh, that bastion of truth on the virtual hardwood. If you will, you can rely on us. But uh, (laughs) with that being said, that has brought us to the end of this week's show. As always, we thank you so much for tuning in and invite you to join us again next week, either on the NLSC mb-live.com, our YouTube channel, or your podcast app of choice. In the meantime, please connect with us on social media. That's where you can get in touch with us and, of course, stay up to date with all of our content. So, Derek, go ahead and bug the handles. Hey, you can find me on Twitter at dfor 384 and at dfor 3 g I'm also on the NLSC, d for 3 and on YouTube, d for 3 I am Andrew in the forum and Andrew NLSC on Twitter. The NLSC is on Twitter and Facebook at the NLSC. Our Instagram is NLSC Basketball. 
We're on YouTube at youtube.com slash NBA Live Series Center. And of course, give a look to the NLSC itself, nb-live.com, for everything we do for basketball video games. So, thank you once again for tuning in. And until next time, I'm Andrew. And I'm Derek. Go get buckets, everyone. Yeah.